at that time, Jesus said to the crowds of the Jews, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life, no life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not such as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Dear friends in Jesus Christ, Today we are celebrating with the Holy Catholic Church the solemnity of the most holy body and blood of Christ. When we commemorate the Eucharist as much as the Feast of Trinity or Pentecost, once again, we don't celebrate a feast of a doctrine, but a feast of events in salvation history. Thus, the very genius of scripture ensures that the reading set forth the saving events rather than doctrines. Therefore, in order to meditate the mystery of the Holy Eucharist, let us right away turn to the readings prepared for us today. In the first reading from the book of Deuteronomy, we read this. Moses spoke to the people saying, you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led to you all these 40 years in the desert. You shall remember. <clears throat> 
the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, who led you through the great and the terrible desert. He brought you water and fed you with manna which your father had never known. This passage comes from the recital of events of the Exodus. Exodus meaning the coming out of Egypt. And it tells us about the wandering of the Israelites in the desert. The text recalls especially the trials to which the people were exposed, namely hunger, thirst, fiery serpents, and scorpions. Then comes the most important part of this text, namely the provisions taken by the good Lord to relieve them, the water from the rock and the manna from heaven. Brethren, there is a principle in the exegesis that says the Bible explains the Bible. In order to understand that text of the Old Testament, we have two texts in the New Testament helping us to understand that text. St. Paul was the first to explain that uh, story in the book of the Deuteronomy. And he considers those two signs, the water and manna, as the signs of the two great sacraments in the church, the sacrament of baptism and the sacrament of the Eucharist. Likewise, another example of this principle of the Bible explaining the Bible is what we shall see in the chapter 6 of St. John, which we have just read in that gospel, treating the manna as the type of the Eucharistic bread. We shall come to it later. St. John Mary Vianney, the famous parish priest of ours, used to say those to say to those who receive the Holy Communion, and I quote, you are not worthy to receive it, but you need it. Indeed, brothers and sisters in Christ, the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist is really an essential nourishment for our life, individual or corporate. Our life being spiritual and physical. In fact, in one of the prayers before communion, we say, uh, asking the good Lord that through his loving mercy, his blood may be for the faithful 
protection in mind and in body and a healing remedy. For the faithful and the church as a pilgrim people of God in this world, the Holy Communion is indeed a viaticum, imhamba, imhamba, Eucharistian imhamba, in our journey here is on this earth as it has been uh, for the Israelites in their wandering in the desert. Their Eucharist was the manna. Second reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 16 to 17. I quote, the bread which we break, is it not a participation into the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. This is a very, very uh, serious affirmation. We would have expected that the epistle, epistle reading on this solemnity would be 1 Corinthians 10, which we cited earlier, where St. Paul interprets manna in the, in the book of Deuteronomy as the type of the Eucharist. Instead, here we have uh, another point all the same important, namely the participation in the body and blood of Christ. Here, for St. John, body and blood refer not to things in themselves, but rather they refer to an event, or rather, and better, to a person. They refer to Jesus Christ giving himself in his redemptive death. In fact, again, according to St. Saint, to Saint Paul, the Holy Communion, meaning the participation in Jesus and his body, becomes identical with the incorporation into the church as the body of Christ. More precisely, the participation in the Holy Communion binds, unites, the faithful not only to Christ but also to his brothers and sisters to the Christian community. In that sense the Eucharist has a horizontal as well as vertical direction that's why the sacrament, the Holy Communion, the, the Holy Sacrament of Eucharist, the Holy Communion, is called a sacrament of unity. Unity with God, unity with our brothers and sisters. We have reached the most important reading, namely the discourse of the bread of life. And I quote some verses. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. He who eats my bread, he and drinks, he who e eats my body and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. <laughs> 
This is the bread which is not such as your fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread has eternal life and will live forever. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. This is a, 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 an affirmation from Jesus Christ himself that when we receive the Holy Communion, we are in an intrinsic union relationship with Jesus Christ and with the Holy Trinity indeed. Brethren in Christ, this is another wonderful example of how the Bible explains the Bible. An example that is, has been noted earlier in the first reading, this passage of St. John's Gospel is called in the exegesis jargon the bread discourse. This whole discourse actually outlines the events of salvation history. One, the coming of Christ as the bread from heaven in the incarnation when he became man. What we celebrate at Christmas, at, at uh, Christmas. The second, the surrender of himself in his death on the cross for our sake. And then, thirdly, the availability of the surrendered life on the cross as the nourishment for the faithful in the Holy Communion. Thus, St. John doesn't regard the sacrament of his Eucharist as a thing in itself detached from the total saving event of Christ, but it is the sacrament and uh, that means the saving event is constantly made available for the present participation in the life of the church, in the life of the faithful. In other words, always a According to St. John, the Eucharist makes the past present and it makes the future present. I explain. The Eucharist in which we participate, the blood and the flesh, refer back to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ in the past. And then it refers to the future. I will raise him up to the, uh, him up at the last, the last day. He will live because of me in the future. And then comes again the present. He who eats my body and drinks my blood has now, in the present, has eternal life. In the sacrament of the Eucharist, the past, the death and resurrection of Christ, the future, the life we hope for in the future until the Lord comes back, all that is brought to the present, the future, and the past. And this makes the meaning, gives the meaning actually to the celebration of the Eucharist. Brothers and sisters in Christ,
believe in the Catholicism of the Catholic Church that the Eucharist is a remembrance, remembrance of the past. In the consecration words, we repeat every now and then after Jesus, do this in memory of me. Thus, the Eucharist not only recalls to mind what Jesus did in the past, but also effectively makes it present again. And what we celebrate now is the anticipation of what we shall celebrate in the uh, eternal banquet. In the Holy Mass, at the moment of the communion, Jesus invites each and every one of us to a table fellowship that is in anticipation of the heavenly banquet itself, as I was saying. Therefore, when Jesus said, do this in memory of me, he was asking us not only to repeat the celebration of the Eucharist, but also to fulfill the missionary mandate implied in that celebration. Brethren and in, in Christ, we should thank the good Lord. We should thank the Holy Spirit which speaks to the church. There has been a time, a long time actually, where people would receive the Eucharist once a year at Easter. Then came a time, namely after the Ecumenical Council of Vatican II, when people were allowed to get communion as often as possible. That's when our children got access to the Holy Communion because the Holy Communion is our life. We can't live as Christians, as faithful, without the Holy Communion. My dear friends, let us thank the good Lord. May he, whom we re repeatedly receive in the Holy Communion, abide with us, forgive us our sins, become our healing remedy, foster much love, service, unity, peace, and a spirit of adoration and thanksgiving. To him be praise, honor, and glory now and forever and ever. Amen.